Hey, this is Joe with Joe and Tell, and right now I am speaking with Andrew Jones. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. I know you have a twin brother. Yes. Uh, Owen. Right? Owen. Yes. Uh, are you identical twins? We are identical twins, and we're what's called mirror twins. Um, in the simplest form, he's left-handed, I'm right-handed. Um, but there's also, with mirror twins, there's uh, something about asymmetry in facial features. So everybody's face is asymmetrical, and in mirror twins, those asymmetries are swapped over. So just has... If you look in a mirror compared to looking at a photograph of yourself, you never, you look at a photo, that, that's not me, that doesn't look like me. What you see of you every day is what you look like in a mirror, where the image comes straight back at you. In a photograph, it's flipped left to right. So that's why you don't think you look like your photograph. Now, with a mirror twin, his asymmetry is opposite of mine. So if I see a picture of me, I think it's him. And same with voices. Uh, you never hear, if you hear a recording of yourself, that, that doesn't sound like me. Um, you hear yourself differently compared to how others hear you. So if I hear a recording of me, then my impression is it's my brother. So it's good. So if I see somebody who I think is Andrew Jones, maybe I shouldn't just go up right away. It might not be Andrew Jones. It could well be my brother. <laughs> okay, Mr. Jones. And he's actually he's done a lot uh, from what I've read about uh, with THX. Yeah. So we both got interested in science. We were always geeks and uh, got interested in science and then uh, audio and photography by early teens. So. We ended up very, very interested in hi-fi. So we were buying hi-fi, we were building stuff, and his was always an interest more towards electronics, and mine, for some reason that I've never fathomed, uh, became speakers. So I'd be trying to build speakers, or even I was trying to build test equipment to measure speakers. Because even at that early stage, uh, before I went off to university, I kind of got into the thought that, okay, so I could build a speaker. How do I know if it's any good? And to me, to know if it was any good meant, well, I need to be able to measure it. How do I measure it? And so I was building little pieces of test gear to find ways of measuring speakers. Um, so that stayed with me throughout my whole career. Um, but we both ended up deciding this is the kind of career we want to pursue. So I uh, went off to university. My brother studied uh, electronics at one university, and I studied physics with some acoustics at a different university, first time we'd been apart. And then uh, after our degree, we joined together at an audio research lab in his university to pursue postgraduate research. He was uh, researching amplifier topologies, I was researching um, computer-aided crossover network design, you know, implementing new algorithms to do computer-aided design. Um, then I stayed on at that university, kind of a little switch that uh, I joined a noise cancellation research group. And uh, so I spent about three years doing active noise cancellation. Then he joined me in that group and I eventually left. So he spent the rest of a significant part of his career in noise cancellation. Just like all the headphones you get these days, the noise cancelling headsets. He did a lot of work and has a lot of patents in that field. Um, I went and joined KEF. And so that was my speaker university, let's say. And um, now, so the, it's one of these, these fingers that just, you know, everything crosses and tangles up in the audio world. So the technical director at KEF, who was my mentor, Laurie Fincham, uh, I came with him to the States, uh, joined Infinity. Um, eventually he became um, sort of chief scientist at THX and started to employ my brother on consultancy work to do design work for THX. And uh, he designed some amplifier topology that became the basic 
building engine of that amplifier. Um, so it's uh, it's all connected. And so he's still doing that amplifier topologies. That's a killer combination right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have some questions from Reddit. I posted mm -hmm. on Audiophile and Budget Audiophile that I'm going to be interviewing Mr. Andrew Jones. And if anybody had questions, to post oh, it yeah. there. Yeah. So, so Andrew Jones doesn't just listen to uh, sweep tests. <laughs> no. Okay. What's one of those tracks? Just one. So, one very... Uh, well, it's a Diana Kroll track. Now, I know in the hi-fi <laughs> world, people don't want to ever listen to Diana Kroll again. It's like going to a show and someone's playing Hotel California by the Eagles. Right? Heard nothing, a few times. nothing to do with judgment of the music. Simply familiarity of, on this particular track, familiarity, and certain aspects of that recording that allow me to easily tell that this range in the speaker is correct, or correct as I view it. Uh, very quick, I can put it on, I'm so familiar, I go, yeah, I need to fix this area in the speaker. Um, I don't use it at hi-fi shows. Um, you played Dead Mouse that one time, I've, I heard. Yeah, I, I try and... I, <laughs> I'm not an arbiter of taste for music. I, I have my ideas of what to play. I have also tracks that I find popular with people that are not always what everyone else is playing. That's part of the goal when you're doing a show. Find music that highlights the system, um, is musically interesting, not just to me, but to most of the people who come in. So that's why when I'm at a show, I'm the one stood up there Picking the music, talking to people, playing. I want to see the reaction. Right. I want to see the reaction both to the sound quality I'm presenting to people. But I also want to understand, do they like that? Do they like my choices of music? I want them to have an experience when they come in. I like that. And I think it reflects in your speaker design also. I think it shows that you know what you like, what your preferences are. But you're also considerate of where how other people are going to use that speaker. Well, that's it. Uh, so let's take hobbyist versus, let's say, professional, right? As a, prof as a professional, you need to be commercially successful. So you need speakers that sound uh, such that people will want to buy them. Now, therefore, am I deliberately designing something that I think will attract people. No, but I've been very lucky that the sound that I'm looking to get has been commercially successful, right? And sometimes you'll listen to some equipment and go, what were they thinking, right? Someone liked that, <laughs> but not enough people to make it commercially successful. So I, I it sounds elitist to say I'm you know, what I like everyone seems to like it's just that's the way it's turned out it's but it's definitely not I'm trying to commercialize the sound that I want as far as the the sound signature uh, you know I, I don't of course I don't expect you to give away all your secrets but uh, like some things that I've noticed so I have the pioneers that that you've made I have uh, I've recommended the B6s, the debut B6s to friends, so I've heard those. I own the Unify uh, UB5s and the UC5, and I have noticed compared to some of the other speakers that I have that maybe the treble is a little bit rolled off, and that's one of the questions that people were having. Um, you know, why, why is the treble so rolled off? I mean, for me, personally, I feel like I kind of like that. I feel like I, I like to be able to turn it up. It's not fatiguing when I do turn it up, so that's me personally, but you know, coming from the source. So, some of the speakers, especially off-axis, were a bit, uh, maybe a little low, you know, the original debut. And they were originally flat on axis, but I made a more directional waveguide on them. And so as you go off-axis, it starts to drop. And I certainly, in terms of tonality that I was wanting to get out of that and making it an enjoyable to listen speaker, 
I certainly erred on the treble being, uh, let's say, on the side flat to low rather than flat to high. I don't like aggressive treble. And I also recognise that when you, the, the likely partnering equipment, the likely quality of the music that's being played, i.e. not audiophile type things, um, they can sound even worse if you've got aggressive treble. Now, again, there are speakers on the market that are always more aggressive treble, and some people like that. That's fine. It's not what I was looking for. So... I accept that it was more of a rolled off sound, except some people like it. And this is always the thing. This is the danger of trying to follow a trend or outguess what someone wants compared to just going with what I feel I want to do. You'll say some, you'll read all the reviews or read uh, comments from people who purchase speakers. And some will go, it's a bit rolled off. Some will go, it's a bit aggressive. Really? But, okay. <laughs> so, if you've got opinions both ways, yeah. then it's kind of, on average, it's about right. All right. Um, nonetheless, I do accept, certainly with the original debut, that it was uh, slightly rolled off, but it gave it a nice, easy listening. That was one of my compromises for the class and price of the speaker. In redoing it, uh, I looked at it again, and one of the issues there, it's not just, let's say, is it flat response on axis? It's, like I was saying, what does it also do off axis? Now, it was a bit more directional. And you're talking about the, the debut? The, the debut. The, the original debut first. Okay. So, as you go off axis, the treble was, due to the waveguide, a bit directional, so it dropped off. It's, it's okay, except uh, as audiophiles, we get into the habit of you set up speakers on stands, away from the walls, you tow them in towards the listening location. Fine. On a $200-ish speaker, or even with the Pioneers at $130, people are not doing that. <laughs> they're putting it on a credenza, they're backing it up against the wall, and they're facing it straight down, right? So you're always off axis where the treble is more rolled off. So always one of the quick answers was tow them in. Yeah, but I don't want to, okay. So in debut two, I've made sure that I've widened the dispersion character. So it doesn't drop off quite as much off axis uh, compared to on axis as the original version did. So um, it's not as critical for, orienting the speaker. So they sound not... This is semantics. They're not bright. They're brighter. They're just a little more open in the top end because I've elevated the treble just a little bit, but not to the extent of making it bright and brittle. Just... It sounds more open. And and you also put the, the bass port in the front. Yes. So not only are you a speaker designer, but you also understand uh, a little bit about practical. Well, that's kind of cool. Once you have a helpline set up and people start calling in, going, the vents at the back. How close can I put it to the wall? Oh, not that question again. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I, I capitulate. I'm putting it to the front. This is a this is a question from Travis per Peregrine. Hopefully Peregrine. Yes. Peregrine. 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 Sign Travis Peregrine. Yes, I'm the soft British. Okay. Um, <laughs> should I listen to music with my speaker grills on or off? And so I'm assuming this is with uh, the ELAC speakers. I have two kids, so grills on for me. So, uh, as a speaker designer, we always say grills off, right? It's very difficult to design a truly transparent grill that has no effect. Um, or combining it with something that looks nice with it on. Uh, a grill that looks nice and has no acoustic detriment, very difficult. So you always got, go to yourself as a speaker designer, oh, grills, what am I gonna do this time? So the answer is, I pretty much always design for grill off. 
Okay. That's the purity, right? Because it's not as if a grill is doing something simple in terms of sound balance. If you have cloth, let's say you had cloth with no frame, cloth will give a very slight attenuation towards the treble. And depending on which cloth you use, it might be just a half dB gradual loss by the treble frequencies, or it might be a dB. If you if you get really bad cloth, it can be a dB and a half. Mm -hmm. That you should reject. <laughs> um, except it is a tone control. But it's a very smooth, gentle character. But everything else about the grill, all the support structure, if it's a wood piece with that's the worst if it's molded and you've got lots of open areas that's not so bad but it causes diffraction and wiggles and you can't compensate for that so the answer is it's always better off there are very rare circumstances where speakers have been designed that they're right with the grill on because of the particular way they've designed it but then it will be wrong with the grill off so, simple answer, always take the grills off. Grills are for protection and to make it look nice, but they're not to make it That's so better. crazy. That's so crazy that it makes a difference with the grill. I mean, I've heard you talk about how the screws made a difference. Yes, and yeah. That's that's amazing. Right. Now, how about, I've seen people actually take off the, the metal grill on the tweeters. I yes. like them. I mean, that's, uh, well, that's protection for me. It is protection. And the important thing with speakers at this price point either both in the stores but at home especially protect the tweeter you don't want people poking things in so there's grills now will that mesh grill make a small change yes it'll also reveal a slot a circular slot where the grill went in which screws up the sound produces a dip in the response so it swings and round rounds. you you change one character but you definitely make another part of it worse some people even we're taking off the whole trim ring yes. around it, right? Yes. Now, I don't mind. If that sounds better to you and you've paid your money, fine. You've voided the warranty, but that's that's your problem. Um, if you want to play things, doing things like that, that's okay. I think the question is, did Andrew Jones design it with the trim ring on and the, the metal on there? Yes. Okay. What's your what's your message to somebody who is happy, or they think they're happy, with their TV speakers or their hundred dollar soundbar? What's something that you would say to them, considering there's a decline in brick and mortar stores where they can actually go out and listen to them? You know, a lot of it is online. A lot of these speaker companies are actually going direct. What would you What would be your message to them to maybe persuade them to? You know, that is a sad fact that brick and mortar is declining for hi-fi because so many things that you purchase they are i'd argue nearly everything you purchase is an emotional decision uh with hi-fi it comes down to the emotion of listening to music you can't experience that by purchasing online you only experience it once you get it home so uh that's a problem that's a problem for all of us in the industry we're all selling um through some online stores, through Amazon, um, because of the decline in brick and mortar. And it's difficult. So you have to rely on other people's recommendations or be prepared to buy it and send it back. And that in itself is a different business model for all of us in the hi-fi industry now because uh, normally, you only bought it once you knew you wanted to buy it. But now you're buying it because you don't know if you do want it. And so somebody's got <laughs> to handle returns, right? Um, so I don't really know what that answer is, um, other than enough people recommending something. But then who do you listen to for those recommendations? I'm trying to figure this out also because people are more than willing to buy a 70-inch 4K TV, the newest UHD, you know, HDR TV, but they don't want to buy anything, you know, sound-wise to improve that. And I, that's something I personally... It's uh, because, partly, uh, the idea that they're just listening to their TV speakers. It's because they've never had to uh, 
had an opportunity to hear better and understand what that can add to the experience. They go to the movie theatres and you got great sound. They've never had that at home, never thought you could approximate that at home, never listened mostly to anyone who got that at home. You know, just if you go looking at if you go looking at homes, uh, buying a home, or you look at these programs on TV about home buying, have you ever seen anyone who's got a hi-fi system in any of these programs? I always programs? look for it. I always look for it. Um, you look at House, the, the, the program yeah. with that doctor, at least he got a hi-fi system in his office. Uh, you look at Suits, he'd got a clip system, yeah. right? So I, I spot those kind of things. Um, so people haven't understood that the emotional impact of, let's say, a movie or just regular program on TV can be enhanced so much more if they upgrade the sound associated with the picture. I think what happens is when they go to the movie theater, my, my theory, is they attribute most of it to the big screen and not so much to the, to the sound. sound. And yet a movie without sound sounds terrible. And there was a very interesting experiment done many, many years ago. They got three different TVs of apparently different picture quality. And you could come in and watch something on each of the TVs and rank order which one you thought was best. What they'd actually done, all three TVs were identical, but they got a better sound system, <laughs> you know, one, two, three. Good, better, best sound system. So what basically happened was the rank ordering went with the better sound. That's the crazy. picture was actually identical. So they understood or they experienced emotionally more involvement and attributed to it must be a better picture because that's what they were told the differences were. And so uh, the sound in a movie is critical and uh, it's just people haven't understood that that can happen in the home. That's a demo that I do in my, my shop. I have a retail shop and people always ask, why do you have all these speakers? And what I'll do is I'll play a trailer on my, on, my, my, on my smartphone and I'll have it connected to those speakers. I'll say, tell me how engaging this is. We're watching from a phone right now, right. but I have them playing through these big speakers. How does this feel? And they're just like, they, they understand at that moment, wow, the sound makes a huge difference. Yeah. So something fun. Um, what does Andrew Jones listen to at home? What is your system at home? Right now. Oh, the system. So speakers are the original TAD Model 1 speakers. Um, the very first design I did for TAD as part of Pioneer, uh, along with a VTL um, big tube stereo amplifier um, and a high-end Berkeley Audio DAC um, running Rune, Rune Labs to source all my music. I do have a turntable set up, I just don't use it that much these days. Um, so that's the home system. Do you find you're competing with yourself a lot of times? But you're competing with oh, your previous yeah, design? Certainly, you, you, we talked earlier about the competition. The competition generally is myself. I've done enough speakers through the years of all the different price points, you know, all the way up to $80,000. So I have in my mind what what sound I can get, and I'm going to try and get as close to that whatever I design, knowing that obviously I'm going to make compromises. Um, so yes, it's <laughs> so when I did the Adante speakers, it's I'd had in mind some speakers I'd done for Pioneer and TAD a while ago. <laughs> so what is new in Elax lineup? The ones that are imminent, actually uh, gone to production right now, is the Argo Navis speaker. So, you know, we talked about wireless and powered, so this is, um, let's say, the starting idea was do an improved version of Unify, but at the same time make it self-powered. So it's three-way active, uh, with a um, active crossover, but not a DSP, it's a analog active crossover. When you build everything in, like um, some of the power speakers you get, you've got the amplification is switching amplifiers, you've got the DSP built in there, you've got the, the DACs built in there. When you buy that, 
that's the best it's ever going to sound. You can't upgrade it because everything's all there. Plug in your source and that's it. So we decided to do halfway house between traditional hi-fi and all-in-one. So it's active for the benefits that gives. It's analog active crossovers so that if you have an existing system with, let's say, a turntable, you're not digitizing the turntable inside the speaker um, or you know, digitizing the analog sound. And if you want to upgrade your preamplifier or your DAC or your turntable, you'll hear that improvement. So the speaker will continue to allow you to get better and better sound out of your system as you upgrade all the other components. So halfway house. And uh, the bookshelf is $2,000 a pair. The tower is $4,000 a pair. So you know, not, not your $100 wireless speaker, but it also has wireless capability. Beautiful. Yeah. Last question from Tao Tao Lulu <laughs> on Reddit as, as well. And the question is, when are you going to release the active version of the ELAC Unify UB5s? <laughs> well, so originally we were looking at simply putting an amplifier inside a Unify. And when we looked at it, when we looked at the cost and the marketplace for that, we realized that's not where we want to go first. We want to test the waters with Argo Navis. So superficially, it looks like we did an active version of Unify, but it's not. It's a, a obviously it's four times the price. And that's because it's upgraded drivers and all the electronics and done as a very uh, good sounding electronics rather than budget. Electronics. We were worried that if we simply activate the Unify, because the Unify was often being used with systems that are much more expensive that, than you would normally partner with a $500 speaker, so the system is sounding really good. And that was a deliberate. Make the speaker so good that you can put in a lot more expense into the rest of the system and really get good sound. If you simply make a... a very affordable powered Unify. You put in lower quality electronics, you put in a DAC, you've limited mm -hmm. just, it's not gonna sound potentially as good as the system you would have been partnering with a Unify. So we thought, okay, let, let's just step back from that decision and go with something to prove to ourselves the potential of what we can do with an active speaker and see how the market reacts to that and then go back and address what do we do as really affordable powered speakers. This is affordable in the context of you look at other higher end active speakers, but it's not affordable if you think that um, $500 was a good price for Unify, it's, it's four times that. So it's not that market. Um, so that was a deliberate decision right now. I would love to see some powered uh, debuts. I would, I would recommend it to everyone. Yeah, well. All you speaker bar people out there. Never say never. <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to do this. All right. I appreciate you. Andrew Jones. The full one hour extended interview is available at patreon.com forward slash Joe Intel. Find out which measurements he finds correlate most with listener preference. Hear what he has to say about different sound signatures and his career in hi-fi audio. And much more from my interview with Andrew Jones.